So, um, hello everyone. Um, I know tonight there'll be some people who haven't met me before. I'm Jack Burns and I uh, founded London Writers Club with Kirsty McLaughlin, who is an agent at David Godwin Associates. And um, I, uh, how we met, she was selling film rights at that point for David Godwin and I wanted her to sell the film rights for um, a novel that I'd sold to Random House because when I first started agenting I thought hey I can do fiction and non-fiction all on my own um, a mistake which I soon rectified because it's really hard to know that number of, of, of um, uh, editors on your own I think you know with a, a solo agent um, maybe the people who are more proficient than me but so I went over to was doing fiction and I said to Kirsty, can you sell um, film rights to this for this please and she said yep yeah, sure anyway when we got together what we talked about was that our industry is an industry of people saying no all the time so when you go out a stack of manuscripts you try and get to know as fast as possible because you know that in a big stack a big inbox if you've got a thousand there might only be you know one or two in there that you might take on so we were a bit disillusioned by that so we set up the club so that we could one keep people's ideas alive when they were still developing them and even if they were getting rejections we kept saying okay let's find out why you're getting rejections let's do something about it let's help you with that and the other reason was okay people say they can't meet agents let's put agents in front of, of um, writers and so that's what we do and we do that live every month um, we have members from all around the world and they receive video or audio or they join us live in a, a venue in London. So Kirsty can't be here tonight, sadly her um, father um, I hope was able to have his funeral today because of course with Corona it's, it's a very difficult thing so Kirsty, lots of love to you. Um, but we have Florence Rees here and do you know Florence when I was reading your um, biog on the AM Heath website I thought mm -hmm. not only do I want her for my agent um, I thought I think you must be a writer too because lots of agents we have aren't writers but your piece was written so beautifully I was so passionate I thought you must be a writer too um no but I had a great piece of advice from my colleague Zoe King who joined us at AM Heath about a year ago now, if not a little bit more. And she just said, imagine you're talking to me, you know, imagine you're talking to a friend. So often the agents write bios and it's really, I know what you mean, it's really stilted because they're trying to cover everything and sell themselves. And we actually all had a sort of rethink of our bios at AM Heath. And hopefully they come across now as a little bit more natural. Um, but they do it good because I think some people found it quite painful to do it. Um, yeah, I know you suddenly realize, oh my god, and I'm asking my authors to um, edit and re edit, and yeah, why can't you get it right? Yeah, of course, we don't exactly. Right. We we're always encouraging them. No, it came across really naturally, and it was like um, a short story of you, which I thought was really nice. That's yeah. great to hear. Thank you. I'm good. glad. So, um what everyone wants to know is mm -hmm. what you're looking for and how we can get you as our agent. <laughs> so perhaps, perhaps first off, like, you know, tell us a bit about the agency and about yourself. Yeah, of course. Um, so AM Heath is 100 years old last year, so it's 101 now. Um, and it was founded by two women who left Curtis Brown once they pretty much single-handedly run um, the agency that was formerly Curtis Brown um, when the men went off to World War One, So they left and um, started this agency. I know it's the most incredible story. If anyone's interested, we've got the entire history on our website. Um, so go have a read about the two founders, Audrey and Alice May, because they were in clearly incredible women. Uh, so I think that spirit of sort of um, the underdog of punching above our weight has kind of persisted at AM Heath, even though now we are, by all accounts, quite a sort of well-established, long-running, successful agency. Um, but we still have a feel of quite a small business, mm. um, which, yeah, is really great. Everyone genuinely gets on. 
we're actually all missing each other like a lot at the moment. It's made the working day quite quite sad in some ways. Um, but so there are seven, eight agents now, um, three foreign rights and um, office manager and two accounts people. Um, and there's a really sort of eclectic range of tastes there. Um, and luckily for me, because there's such a range, but because people are quite focused with what they do, I've been able to just sort of do what I like, um, which is great, but also um, it means that I'm able to access a lot of my colleagues' knowledge. So like it was interesting that you said that doing both fiction and nonfiction is quite difficult. Um, I actually do both, yeah. um, or for the time being, I'm doing both. And um, I, I know it would be so much more hard to sort of figure out who is right for which project if I didn't have, you know, the collective brain of seven other agents, some of who do just nonfiction, some of who do just fiction, some do both, but in really specific areas. So we have like a real range at Aim Heath. So there's Bill, who's been there for about 30 something years. <laughs> um, he does a lot of serious nonfiction, history, um, politics and literary fiction. And he's the agent of Hilary Mantel. Um, so we've obviously had quite an exciting um, few weeks with that. There is Victoria Hobbs, who's been there for 20 years now. She does a lot of literary fiction, um, and is moving to do some more non sort of smart women's nonfiction. Um, there's Becky Ritchie, who does purely commercial fiction um, and some nonfiction, but just commercial stuff, which she absolutely loves. There is Ollie Munson, who does sort of commercial, but more speculative or edging to. Um, so authors like Lauren Bucus or Sarah Lotz, who um, crime thriller, not quite fantasy sci-fi, but further along that spectrum. You and Thornycroft, who has again a real mix of authors, both non-fiction and more literary fiction. And then there's Julia Churchill, our children's agent, who is um, sort of one woman powerhouse for our children's department, who does pretty much everything. And like I said, my colleague Zoe, who is on maternity leave, but she does all things in the commercial nonfiction, um, from brain health to the power of algae. Um, and I sort of sit in a little niche, which is not extremely commercial fiction, um, but not um, really literary. So that sort of sweet spot, book club, um, reading group fiction. And then slightly more serious agenda driven nonfiction on um, that side. So at the moment I'm um, having, uh, well, I'm, I'm working on a book um, called Brown Girl Like Me. So it's by a British author who's basically writing about what it is to be a modern brown British feminist in today's world. Um, so yeah, that's a sort of, yeah, it's a, that's a snapshot of our agency. Um, but I hope I've demonstrated it has a real breadth and there's pretty much nothing we don't do apart from like film stars, biographies and things like that. I heard that. I heard. I felt like I did a three hundred and sixty degree tour of a, of a bookshop of every shelf. The only thing I didn't hear, but I bet it's covered under, is cookery and food writing. Who's? Um, so that is Zoe a bit, and also right. um, Victoria has a little bit of that. So she's got a book coming out next year, which is Burmese. The, these two sisters who started a Burmese um, supper club. Um, so it's really, it's um, kind of, it depends, yeah, it depends on the project and the agent, but those two, they do that. And how about illustrating? Do you have a lot of cookery writers? Me? Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, within the club, you mean? Uh, um, no, I mean, in, in yeah. No, um, I mean, I live with, I live with one. Well, find out. 
<laughs> yeah, we will find out. In um, the comments. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what about um, uh, illustrated coffee table type books? Um, Zoe. Zoe, okay, cool. Although I have started to um, do some of that on while she's on her maternity leave. Um, for example, I'm working on a book uh, with an author who's writing about finding um, finding nature in an urban life. So how to connect with nature, its benefits. I know it's quite painful working on it, not being able to go outside. You have to just get someone to a hang you the window by your feet or something. Yeah, just just gaze longingly and imagine the power of imagination. <laughs> you can do that. Um, I've just had somebody say, um, uh, what is smart women's non-fiction? Did you say that? I don't remember you saying that, to be honest. I did, I did. Um, so it's one of those terms that editors use and it kind of bleeds over, I think, into... Um, uh, it's, it's quite difficult to define, but... Um, I re it, it's just a lot of non-fiction is aimed towards I think men and it's sort of redressing that balance mm -hmm. so things that women are more interested in you know not necessarily um not that I mean people can be interested in anything but I think the focus we always hear about um men reading only books by men but women reading books by men and women um so just finding out, finding more books that women are interested in reading, mm. basically. Yeah. Well, that's kind of funny, a funny thing though, isn't it? Because generally it's always, oh, it's only women who read books. But I'd never really thought about that. I don't think I've ever had this notion before about um, men and nonfiction. Interesting. Yeah, I know, I know a lot of men who in their older age, and I mean like post kind of 40, they stop reading fiction altogether and they only read nonfiction. It's quite interesting. Yeah. I mean, no, I think that's a little... to be perfectly honest. I feel quite embarrassed by how little um, research is done by the publishing industry um, as to you know what we read and how we read and all that sort of stuff. Um, yeah. Anyway, we can't solve that one tonight. But um, t so tell us more about you now because you've you've done such a brilliant um, more than a snapshot. You painted an incredible portrait of, of the um, agency and what everyone does. But it'd be great to hear you kind of slightly go off on one about yourself and the things that you, you want um, as well. Definitely. Um, it's a real mix. So I've taken on, I've, I, my list has sort of been open for about a year now, if a little bit under. And I've taken on seven or eight authors in that time. And they're split pretty much half and half fiction, non-fiction. Wow. Um, yeah, it's, it's quite a nice um, mix. They're all, um, they're all women, unfortunately. And that's because I haven't actually got that many submissions from men. I think the men... It's certainly from what I see, I see the submissions in our um, inbox for myself and two of my colleagues at least. And I do see a lot of the men submitting to men. So I don't, I don't know how I can fix that, but please men feel free to submit to me. Um, because I did have someone say, I notice you only represent women. Is that a deliberate choice? And I said, no, it's absolutely not. Um, so, it's a real, yeah, so it's a real range. It, I have um, a woman, the one I mentioned, writing Brown Girl Like Me, so that's a non-fiction sort of memoir manifesto type of what, yeah, so what's, what's going on in today's world that makes it really hard to be a modern British Indian woman, Indian feminist. Um, there's someone else who's writing uh, a sort of a, a love story in all its forms, so family love, the love between friends, the love you have in relationships, and what happens when all of those are sort of taken away from you, and how do you survive as a as a young person in the world today? Um, and on the nonfiction side, a bit of nature writing, um, a bit more. Uh, what else have I got? Um, oh, another book about sort of quite agenda driven. It's called Rough Sex and it's about the um, 
normalization of violent sex against in in the bedroom um, so i'll be sending that out soon um, and i find authors in a real variety of ways um, i think the thing about agenting is that it's become a lot more um, outward looking so 20 years ago it would be all submission based you just um, once in a while i think people would find authors from the journalism they did but it would be pretty much who, what, who submitted what to you but now it's so much more going out and finding um, people who are saying interesting things about interesting topics um, and unfortunately it's still it's becoming increasingly platform focused oh, yeah. Um, yeah. and that's something yeah that's something we're really struggling with in nonfiction. um so either they come back and say oh well great idea but uh where you know what what's her platform where does this come from mm. um and that's something that i hope will go away um but it seems to be here to stay for a little while um and that is luckily not the case in fiction still. So nonfiction is a bit tricky, but we keep going. And if you've got a great idea, hopefully that will always win out. And if, if you can write beautifully, then I, th I would hope that publishers would see past sort of not having an amazing 100,000 Instagram followers or Twitter followers. Um, but luckily fiction is less based on that but it is um it's increasingly hard at the moment the conversations we have in the office do mean that oh we we've just been talking about how fiction is um yeah it's just become increasingly difficult to sell um we keep hearing that all the time it's really um yeah it's really it's it's quite sad it's, it's exactly depressing um because fiction novels are such a brilliant form of, of escapism. I mean, I don't know about everyone else, but I've, I think I've got them all on my sofa somewhere, but I've been reading kind of nonstop since um, we've all been sort of put on lockdown. And I find them the most effective form of escapism there is. So, um, I, that's the kind of thing that I like to represent. Anything that will transport me somewhere that isn't the current situation. Yeah, absolutely. And it's 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 a funny thing, isn't it? It's like um, you know, sometimes when um, new genres pop pop up, sometimes I think they pop up out of a, a real need, you know, um, and it just so happens that because of kind of the collective unconscious that, that people have been writing the stuff that we seem to need. And when you get that sweet spot, mm -hmm. what we need that someone just happened to have already written, that's brilliant. But when you, earlier you, you talked about um, Brown Girl book, you called it um, a memoir manifesto. That's yeah. Because we, again, we were told a while back, oh, no one's interested in um, memoir anymore. Oh God, memoir is, I, all I hear from editors is, oh, I'm looking for memoir. Memoir, memoir, memoir. <laughs> yeah. Oh, can you just speak up? I think you may be um, um, muted. Yeah. Oh, I, there you go. You're fine. I just, I just muted because my, um, my partner is, um, he's the food editor at The Guardian and he um, is working from home for the first time. And he thinks that working from home means you march up and down the, the corridor talking in a really loud voice and rising up the <laughs> dog and talking over my computer and um and not cooking as much as he normally does either so that's why i'm so so rude so rude no i know right journalists <laughs> as opposed to authors <sighs> shocking <laughs> um so yeah where did that come from memoir manifesto um and how did you get away with that split do people i mean you get it immediately when you say that don't you you get what it is um uh it's a diff it's a tricky one because um it's there's um there's a real fine line some publishers say 
Oh, we, so she's a, she's a brown British um, Indian Sikh. And that is an underrepresented voice in publishing. Um, and there are, for example, when, when I went to um, Bend It Like Beckham in the theater four years ago, I'd never seen such a diverse audience. Wow. And when you go to events like Afwa Hirsch's events or um, events with Michelle Obama last year at, the, at South Bank, you see that publishing it really isn't serving its um, the, the community, the population very well. So when I send out something like this, I am taking a lot of publishers at face value that they are interested and want to buy voices that are underrepresented. Um, but it was definitely a little bit of a punt because if you're not, if you haven't got a huge platform, it's hard to sell a memoir. Or, you know, if you haven't got a truly unique story, it's hard to sell a memoir. Um, so I suppose the memoir manifesto came out of one wanting to make sure that people knew that this was authentic, but also not just being about one woman's journey, being about the journeys of, or the experiences of so many um, women in our country. Um, and some people, you know, it's, it's had a really um, positive response. Um, so crossing my fingers on that one. <laughs> Sounds great. Sounds great. Actually, that's, um, that takes me to uh, something that we often try to explain when we are helping a writer improve their work. When we say, to them, um, you know, the closer we can get to the action and, and, and your life and, and, you're, what you're thinking, what you're feeling, and, and, and a powerful voice, the, cl the more universal the, the story becomes. And it, it's sometimes hard to explain mm. that, that touch, isn't it, uh, of how you achieve that. I mean, it's not, it's definitely not stream of consciousness because... No, but it's, it's skillfully weaving uh, a story that's not quite your own, but may be recognisable to some people in your life. I, I, when you asked me if I was a writer, I had that internal thing of, oh, God, no, because I <laughs> am constantly in awe of, of authors. I really couldn't do it. Um, the discipline um, that goes into writing is really astounding. Um, but I think, you know, it's, it's a hard learned skill. Um, and practice makes perfect, you know. If you look at someone like, we represent Maggie O'Farrell, for example, everyone is saying that this novel that's coming out, I think today or tomorrow, is her best yet. And it's her eighth book, you know? It's a, it's a skill that takes years and years to sort of hone. Um, so that is advice that I think we're constantly um, in repeating and encouraging with because it it does take some you know a lot of people most writers years to write a, a draft that they're happy with and that their agent is happy with and that is sort of fit ready to be sent out it always takes longer than you think Sometimes it's, it's that funny thing, isn't it? Um, I, I've gotten very good at explaining to people um, what I mean when um, I've given sort of one level of, of feedback and then it comes back and there's another. It, it's, it's like, ugh, the only thing I can think of is, is when I weed in my garden, sorry, women of a certain age here. Um, and you look at your garden, you think, oh, it looks okay. And you go a bit closer and you think, oh, it needs a bit of work there. And then the closer and closer you get and the more you do, the finer it becomes and, to, and, this, and you realise how much there is to do. And thank God you didn't realise mm -hmm. that I slipped in the garden in the first place. It's the same with the book, you know. Um, uh, it doesn't happen very often, but occasionally somebody will feel like, um, oh, you know, why didn't you point that out in the first place? It's like, well, because in the beginning, you're looking at the big picture, you know, you're looking at the story. Yeah. Because there's no point polishing a turd. You don't go to the finer stuff until you've figured out the, the bigger stuff. 
Um, so I'm always yeah. talking about premise. I mean, you know, what's with your authors, where usually is the kind of point at which you are prepared to engage with somebody and take them on, even if the work needs quite a bit of editing? It's a good, it's a good question. And it really depends um, for me on a f what happens in a first meeting. So I think it's always best um, before, well, what I do before I take anyone on is either meet in person or have a phone call and just test the waters with how your editorial comments are received. Um, and I think you can tell so much just from a conversation, just whether one, you and the author get on. And that's so, so important. Um, you, I, it's really difficult to have a working relationship if you don't have a certain degree of sort of camaraderie. Um, so I think that is always my first point of call, having a conversation and pointing out the places where I think um, some work needs to be done and how the author receives that. You know, we as agents are quite often involved in um, sort of what we call um, beauty pageants where, you know, you're you know that you're one of many author, many agents that an author is seeing um and some agents there's a real um there's two ways that some people go about it one group will say perfect absolutely nothing needs to be done great i'll sign you right here and now another group say well i think these things could be changed or how do you think you know how do you think about doing this and different authors respond to different um you know attitudes and i'm not saying that either one is the right way forward because you know everyone has their own way of making a success or making a sale um but personally for me i always need to have a conversation with someone first we often hear we often hear stories where um agents uh you know, will take someone on it's all rosy and as you said it's the beauty parade so they're really keen it, it, their competitive spirit kicks in they're keen to sign someone on and then it goes mm. quiet and a bit lonely for the author so we yeah. have a lot of um not a lot but we have people at the club who say you know what's happening can you can you translate this um this agent's behavior for me because they've gone very quiet they'll you know barely see me they won't even have a cup of coffee like once every six months or a year or whatever um, mm. So yeah, it's. I mean, do, you, do you discuss those things with new authors? Would you have a conversation about how much contact you'd expect, or or do you just kind of let it go organically and hope you've got an emotionally intelligent person that you you know you establish that in the first meeting with them? Um, I hope to establish a sense of um, knowing what that person might want or expect um, but probably my most um, productive way of, have, of setting up this relationship was an author who um, actually asked me what my favorite what, what, what my sort of preferred way of communicating was um, you know and she was very funny about it all she said do you want to whatsapp do you want to email do you want to call um, should we talk by carrier pigeon? You know, those sorts of things. Yeah. But, and she said, this is how I prefer to do it, but I'm aware that that's not the same for everyone. So let's find a way that works for us both. Um, but it really depends on um, the author. It's, I think, I personally would feel, um, uncomfortable or guilty if I hadn't replied to an author in two weeks. But what I would always want one of my authors to remember is that it's not because I am ignoring them, it's because I just don't like to dash off responses and yes. I prefer to take the time to truly think about what they are asking me or sending me 
Um, and I think a lot of people have the email guilt. So it, it for basically anyone I work with, we definitely get the feeling of, oh, okay, you know, it's been in your inbox for a little while and you know it's there and you know you will reply to it. Um, and I would hope for my authors that there's enough trust between us that they know that I will reply when I can. Yeah, and I, I think um, in, sometimes the silence is because um, you don't want to dash up a quick email when you're actually asking somebody to do some work. Yeah, um, you know, you definitely. You let it sink in and, let it, let, and think about whether that's what you really want them to be doing. Yeah. Um, shall we open up for some questions now? So if you could just type your questions in the chat, then we'll start taking those questions. Um, but uh, so, if, if there's anything you would say that you are desperate for right now in any, in a particular area, what would it be? I make one fiction and one not fiction. Would be good. Well, that's a good question. Um, a lot of people say this, but I would love um, an epic, distracting um, love story, contemporary, um, because I find. Those are the most, um, the novels that I get the most sort of lost in. Um, so. what, what do you mean by, um, I, I can't, oh, I'm just trying to think of it. So the only love story I can remember that I actually enjoy, God, I'm so hard, is probably um, Thornbirds. Apart from that, I can't really even think of any decent sort of love story. What, um, what's one I've loved recently? Um, this isn't that recent, but I adored Laura Barnett's The Versions of Us. Okay. I thought it was brilliant. Um, it was very clever. It was one of the earlier um, playing with time and timelines. Um, someone's just said one day. Um, I did like that a lot. Oh, but I didn't see the chat. I wasn't sure if you could see it. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, I can see it. I, but I'm, I'm trying, I'm looking, yeah, sure. I'm trying actually not to look at myself. <laughs> so I haven't been looking at it too much. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, one of my colleagues represents, um, oh, I'm not going to be able to remember her name now. This is always the problem when you're put on the spot, remembering authors' names, even though you've absolutely adored their books. Um, let me come back to you on that one. I'm saying, do you represent crime writers? And if so, any particular types of crime novel? Um, I don't personally, but both my colleagues, Ewan and Ollie, do. Ollie um, does a lot of crime. Um, actually, both of them do. They have, that's probably their area of crossover. Um, so whenever someone's submitting to us for a crime novel, I would just go to the agent's page and um or google your favorite crime writer or a few and go to who their agent is and or see what other projects they represent because ewan's probably a slightly more literary side and um ollie a bit more commercial but yes they both do crime writers right and we'll find we'll find the details on the um on the website yeah uh, so um rohan is asking about the crossover between commercial and or oh, Where's that gone? That question. Commercial and um, oh god, I've lost my chat now. Um, for some reason it's not scrolling up for me. He was asking about the crossover. Uh, you, Ryan, you might have to ask it again. But somebody asked a really good question there of um, with um, Corona. Um, what is the publishing industry saying? Do you know, to be honest, I haven't seen anything yet. Um, last Friday, we didn't have shut down, so I don't know what the bookseller said, and I didn't read it last Friday because it's too much. Mm -hmm. But have you got any sense of what will happen? I mean, I've just had a contract um, for an author sent to me this morning. Uh, it took me to respond to my queries, which is a bit slower than usual, but I got a contract back this morning, and I just got a right steal through for somebody else. So, you know. Um, yeah, I think in about 70% of our business is like business as usual. People are remote working, but I've had a project go through acquisitions in the last week. So things are running um, a little, albeit a little bit slower than usual. Um, and we're really yet to see in my office what the impact of not having um, London Book Fair will be, because obviously that's 
for agents in particular, that's a massive part of our calendar where we, we need, you know, refresh relationships and pitch books, pitch our authors, books, foreign publishers. Um, so that, um, like, hopefully that won't lead to a reduction sort of foreign sales, but we really can't tell yet. Mm. And in terms of the publishing industry in general, um, we're really worried about authors who are being published this week or last week or in the next six weeks. Um, publishers are pivoting, trying to focus on digital um, advertising and sort of, you know, online publications. But there's no question that it's going to be a real, um, a really tricky time. But I think it will hopefully be compensated for by a lot of um, a lot more activity on Twitter. I don't know if you've found, but I book Twitter as a great place in general anyway. But um, in the last week, it's become even more positive. And I've seen so many more established authors shouting out, saying, I'm, I'd love to help um, people who are being published right now. Give me a shout and I will try and publicize your book. Um, so we're not, I saw a very well established, um, sort of quite prestigious nonfiction editor say, I'm sure this will change how we buy books, but I just don't know how yet. Yeah, yeah. But I think that's generally, we don't know how it's going to change everything. The point of disruption, I think, and Jermaine Greer said this in the um, context of menopause in her book, Change, you know, there's no point having huge disruption if you're not going to evolve in some way and I think I think you know that is what will happen um actually it reminds me there is a poll um I've never used polls on here before but I'm asking the question is now a great time or a terrible time to write a book and if anyone can see how to get into that poll then please do vote on that but if not I'll send it to everyone later I've got Peter saying I have a crime adventure novel complete at 115,000 words is this the right length or a little heavy a little heavy it's hard to sell a debut that's over a hundred thousand words. Okay, that's you know, so it's a it's a lot to it's a lot for an editor to get through. Um, and um, I'm working with an author right now, and she's submitting some something to me that was a hundred and twenty thousand, and we are getting it down, and we've just got it down to a hundred, and it's even more has got to go. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, no, that's. That makes perfect sense to me. Um, is there receptivity for politically charged literary fiction that is epic with strong romantic elements? Hmm, sounds like a mix up, doesn't it? Mindy. That was... um, I mean, I think it can be done. For example, Home Fire by Carmela Shanti has all those things. Um, but it has to be, you know, you have to be a skillful writer and make sure that not one element overwhelms the others. Mm. yeah I mean it, it has to be it, it's a bit like you know those kind of smorgasbord or buffet type places some of them make you heave because there's too much going on and others are just perfect and you just want to yes yeah. and you don't know where to go first but it's always a food analogy it's me um, <laughs> um I, Is it is a door uh, Isadora, I find that all agents are either children plus teen or adult. My manuscripts as 10 year old protagonists written for an adult audience, but some of its themes are gr of growing up it means it would probably resonate with teens YA as well. Mm, I think that's unlikely. But anyway, can you answer that? Um, the reason that people, agents tend to focus on one, of, one or the other is that publishers certainly in our experience are really um hesitant to buy anything that's written in the voice of a child teen young adult because they don't know how to sell it um so that's why um it's it's a really it is a really tricky thing to do um and publishers are, they just come back and say sorry this isn't for my list and then you or an adult publisher will say that and then you go to a YA publisher and they'll say oh sorry this isn't my list and it's very difficult to find someone with the right um, vision to publish it but also the right story. Mm -hmm. So your advice would be decide one way or the other? Oh. 
Ooh. lost you. Am I ooh, am I back? Yeah. Um, so would your advice be decide one way or the other? Um, which one? Yes. Yeah. Pitch it in one area for firmly because otherwise people find it really hard to know how to look at it. And that's, uh, that's not, that's not ideal, but that's, I think, a pragmatic. Um, uh, Ramona's yeah. asked about children's fiction that was mentioned earlier. Um, who is the um, children's fiction person? Julia Churchill. She's on our website. So she does children's YA. Although YA is a really, I've heard a lot of publishers are struggling with that as well. Oh, really? Yeah. So, uh, uh, I, I mean, there were some amazing YA authors for a while there. Yeah, there are. They went quiet, so I, they, they, they haven't. They haven't had a big success um, since I think. Um, uh, what's it called? Divergent. That I think that was the last big YA book they've had. Patrick Ness as well. I keep waiting for another book from him, but he, he doesn't seem to be writing one. Selfish man. He's probably having a life rather than writing. <laughs> um, you tell him. <laughs> uh, do agents monitor self-published work? Uh, you have to explain what you mean by that, Norman. By what you mean by monitor? I I know what he means. Um, agents don't, but publishers do. Um, I know non-fiction and fiction publishers, editors who keep a, a really close eye on um, the Kindle charts. Um, uh, unfortunately, there's only, you have to get to a certain level of success before you'll get noticed. Um, and that's just the way that the Amazon algorithms fall out. Um, yeah, uh, I, I wondered if you meant do they agent uh, self-published work as well, but anyway. So Monet, okay. Uh, Maybe you meant that, but they do, some do, some do, because Lizzie Heath. Some do, yeah. Yeah, yeah. David Hyam, Lizzie Kramer. Um, uh, someone mentioned Hunger Games. Um, not, that's an old... They were talking about a big breakout YA book. A long time ago, though. That's, that's what we're saying. Yeah. We're saying there aren't any uh, of late. Um, yeah. You've spoken about some of the genres that are not doing well at the moment. Are there any genres you think are overdue a rise in popularity? Oh, crystal ball, that would be good, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, I mean that is like that is what every agent wants to know and every publisher. Um, Nonfiction is very robust at the moment, um, that's and that's yeah, it's great because about five six years ago, it was the complete opposite and you couldn't sell a non-fiction project for um love nor money so who knows what will be next <laughs> it's really hard to tell yeah, it really is. um and some are saying um yes yeah, sorry that's my pronunciation francis ya um why i um my aussie accent coming in um are certain genres like psychological thrillers so dominant that other genres are falling away that's from home um, I think psych suspense is on the decline. Uh, it's, it's, it's such a saturated market that um, I, we ha aren't really hearing of publishers going wild for it in the same way. If you were writing psychological a, a psychological thriller, because don't forget this didn't used to be a thing, how mm. would you gently reorient it or reframe it? <laughs> So, wait, sorry, can you repeat the question? How would you reframe? Yeah, how could you, you, you talk could, about it? Slightly twiddle with, with genres sometimes to soften their edges and yeah. slightly over. Where would you where would you push them over to or what how would you twiddle with them? Do you think? It would depend on the book, of course, that's probably the stupid question. Yeah, I think it I think it depends on the book and I think um it, just as long as you've got a genuine um fresh pitch letter you know you know what you're writing about um and you're you've got a strong story then agents are always going to look at it and be interested in reading it um but it, it's an inevitable fact that it is just really saturated and it has to be better than some of the stuff that was published uh, three or four years ago mm. Keep on getting better. That's what we have to yeah. Do. Um, uh, what about short story collections? 
they're more popular aren't they wouldn't they if you get the right they're thing. definitely getting more popular um it's yeah the thread that you put through them that's that's key it's how you collate them and hang what's what hangs them yes through. yeah do you have a theme you know we've seen some really well-established authors publish their short story collections and i wonder for how long they've been writing them and sort of at what point their publisher deems them enough of a success that they get a, self, a short story collection. Um, but they are definitely, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you are now ready. Um, there's definitely more of a market um, for it now. I think there are it helps. Sorry. Well, I think what I've seen is it, it actually it really helps if you have uh, doesn't have to be as strong as a theme, but um, that's something that um, gently links them together. Um, for example, I'm reading Curtis Sittenfeld's short story collection that was published a couple of years ago. And um, it, to me, it seems it's all about um, the last five years of life in America. Um, being a liberal person in the run-up to Trump's America and what that is like and what it's like to be a woman in that era. Even though all these stories are completely random, mm. they explore similar themes. I think that helps. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I, think, I, think, I think it has to. I mean, you think of a, an album, um, it... It always, well, it always represented a period in a, an artist's career, like a, a style that they were going through. And even if mm. there were some kind of different styles within that, they would, you know, the, 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 the cover um, and the title of the album would hold that together. So I think that's... Yeah, look at other there things. was coherence. Yeah, yeah. yeah. One of the best, um, one of the books that made me go, oh, I wish I'd thought of that, was <laughs> The Tent, The Bucket and Me. Um, by Emma Tennant. I don't know if you've read that. It's one of the few books that made me laugh yeah. out loud on the tube. Um, it was a scene, spoiler alert, it's a scene where they're trying to get their grammy, granny in the car and they can't stop the car, can't stop the engine to pick her up. So she has to go around the block and then drag her in the car. But why that was clever it was because, in effect, it, was, it wasn't even short stories. It was each, each chapter was a story of a camping holiday they'd taken. And so the, the only thing that linked them, there was no... Um, no sense of uh, linear progression. We didn't know how old she was in any of these episodes, but it was just disastrous camping holidays with their family. And I thought, my God, that's a clever way to write a book because you don't even have to make them all that's, together. It's brilliant. That's very funny. Uh, yeah. It's very it's it's worth a read. Yeah. Okay, um, good. I always like a recommendation. <laughs> so, um, Julia, as you might. That's quite a long one. I was told that the genre of my book is either fictionalized memoir or autobi autobiographical fiction. Um, they kind of mean the same thing, don't they? Um, do they mean the same thing? Um, which one sounds better? Mm. Well, not the first one. Fictionalized memoir doesn't sound good. Well, unless you have a very good reason for fictionalizing some of it. Um, I don't know how many people have read Maggie O'Farrell's I Am, I Am, I Am, but in an interview, she talks about how um, restricting it was to write memoir because she realized she couldn't just say, oh, you know what would be better was if this character was 10 years older and Spanish and, you know, had this experience at this point in their life, which meant this. And she, you know, she, she had to be really strict with herself when writing memoir because it was her own life. Um, and I think the authenticity of that book um, is like, it's, it's such a powerful book in general. Um, and even though she doesn't reveal all, it's uh, the experiences that she talked about are so powerful and that's the whole point of memoir for me I, I i can't really ever see myself picking up a fictionalized memoir because what 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 is it then it's actually just a story yeah 
I, I just think, um, I think you need to decide which you want to do. So you, you yeah. know, and you, you say, yes, it's loosely based on me. You say that at some point, or mm. you write it as, um, as memoir and you use poetic license, but, but I think just yeah. sell it as one or the other. Um, yeah. Written in third person limited. Um, I think that's another thing that's making your book difficult because that's a really difficult um, mode of address. What do you think? Sorry, I, could, I couldn't hear that. It's written in third person limited, which is another difficulty. I think that's really tricky. Yeah, it is. <laughs> um, I think as, there has to be a, like supreme commitment to it. Um, if it is, and um, I don't know that. Yeah, that's quite a tricky one. I think it's it's not something that would necessarily turn me on. So mm, I, I think I've only read one, and I found it really hard going. Sorry to be disheartening, but um, I don't know. Sometimes I think it's you know with like. With that, I, I know this lady very well, she comes to the pub a lot. And um, without you in front of me, it's kind of good to be able to say things like that, I suppose, it's just just boldly that, you know, that's a hard thing to do. And, and you know, you, I know you're working really hard and you're not one of this hard to pull those things off. Um, I'm sure if anyone can do it, you can. But um, yeah, it is good to know the honest truth, which is why we ask these questions. Um, Galaxy S10, I write in foreign language, the first draft of my book, and then I'll translate it. I know my English isn't great and I would need a lot of help with editing, but would any English agent even be interested to read it? Which country, Galaxy S10, would be good to hear? Um, but usually um, you would publish in your, in your, own, your home country, wouldn't you? Um, yeah. yeah. I think it's, um, translated fiction is, um, it's, it's quite a tricky one. And the way it does best is when it's published is, or the way certainly how I, what I see in our um, publishing industry is when it's um, done well in its own original country and language mm. and then translated here. Yeah. yeah. Um, I've just noticed there's another little place where there are some questions. Um, do you work with foreigners? I mean, I mean, people who are not native and sometimes demands correction. I think Dorothy, you need to sort that out before you send it to an agent. Um, I don't know if you agree, Florence. Yeah, you need. To I do. Yeah. Yeah. It's you know it's yeah it's not fair to expect someone to do that. Um, uh, Isadora, you've already asked that question. Ben, um, I happen to be querying a YA novel which has a suspected virus as a major plot point. Oh dear, perfectly topical or completely off the market right now? Well, it's an interesting question, and I think it just depends on. Um, agent to agent. For example, one of our authors, Lauren Bucus, um, started writing a novel years ago about a pandemic that knocks out 95% of the male population. <laughs> and, she, you know, years before any, um, anyone heard the word coronavirus. Um, and I think we're choosing to look at it as fortuitous timing. <laughs> um, but if we were sending it out at this point, who knows yeah. um it depends i think on the on the person um and I, th I think the interesting thing about people is some people um love to escape and not focus on what's going on, on in the world but for example the film contagion is now in the itunes top 10 in the last two weeks and that's a film literally exactly about a much more deadly but very similar type of situation where a virus spreads around the world. So I don't think it's necessarily terrible timing at all. So they could use that in their pitch letter. Yeah, they could. Yeah, get the numbers on that. Yeah. Um, so next person, my co-author and I are looking for an agent because our publisher isn't doing anything to promote our book. It's a tiny indie publisher recently sent up, set up and we think they just don't have the resources. However, I've heard some agents don't like already published books. Is that true? And do you have any tips for us? Oh, well, it's, it's difficult because a lot of an agent's job is finding a publisher for, a, for an author. Um, and it's, 
um, you know, most of our job is successful sort of management between author publisher agent and I think um, coming in after the process halfway through the process it's not necessarily a recipe for success um, because a publisher might think who the hell is this person shoving themselves in where they are not um, even a party to the contract mm. um, it might be an idea to find an agent for your next project for example um, but it's it's very hard to come in after the fact and um, start not demanding things but encouraging a publisher to do xyz why haven't they done this i think it's it's quite easy for a relationship between an author and the publisher to sour at that point I think it also depends, doesn't it, on your, on the deal. Like if you're in a deal where you get all the income, um, then maybe you want to um, hire a PR and or do some, a lot of PR work yourself. Mm. But if you're in a situation where you're just getting a royalty and they're, and they're getting the, the bulk of the income, then you, sometimes you have to draw a line up under it. You ha I mean, I think you have to decide what it is you want to achieve. Do you yeah. want to be successful irrespective of where the money's going or, you know, um you can you can write other versions you know different versions of, of the same book without being too um without sort of uh what am i trying to say um with the contract without uh breaching yeah breaching contract that's like breaching trousers that's what i need a trouser word um <laughs> so uh Talia, did you have a client you weren't sure of initially who then changed your mind? Mm, what caused the change? Cakes, wine, bribes? Oh, bribes always work. Um, no, uh, no, is the answer to that. I've had um, someone I've worked with sort of briefly where we came to the end of a road and parted quite am amicably because it just wasn't going to work out for a variety of reasons um, <laughs> um but no i think not not um i don't i can't imagine if you reach a point where you're disagreeing with an author um over most things what would um change your mind and you'd figure or that out their mind. The first time you you can for some. Um, Anne is asking, do you think now is a good time to submit to agents, or do you think a lot of people are distracted by the current situation? Um, I can only speak for our company, but we're working pretty much as normal. Um, I spoke to an editor today who, although this isn't strictly you know the same, but she's really pleased to still be receiving submissions from agents. So I think it's as good a time as any. Yeah, I, I've seen people on um, I've seen people on Twitter, agents on the Twitter, saying, "Oh, um, please, I'm here. Send me stuff." Yeah. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, is it ever worth from Romany? Is it ever worth nudging an, an agent who hasn't replied after you sent a full manuscript? Yeah. Mm. Definitely. Um, so it's an unfortunate like fact of just I think everyone's lies that sometimes you have you you know call a call something in with the best of intentions but um, things for example worldwide pandemics happen and you don't um, have the concentration that um, like a situ you know you don't have you haven't read something in the time that you'd meant to so I think a nudge is always as long as it's um, respectful, polite, sure. um, a nudge is always um, an okay thing to do. But, um, how long would you leave it? Sorry, I knew this would happen at some point. She's been such a good girl. Oh, hello. She's been such a good girl, but she just couldn't help Can you it. just transmit her over the phone? I'll, I'll take her. <laughs> She's been so good, um, but she had to come in, didn't you, Lily? Yeah. Um, <laughs> So how, how long would you give them? Because they're, if they're asking for a full manuscript, they're quite interested, aren't they? They're not sort of... Yeah. yeah. Um, I wouldn't chase sooner than two weeks. After the full, yeah. Yeah. OK. 
okay, cool. Um, I think we'll just take a few more questions because we're probably we're drying your mouth out, which is supposed to be bad for virus um, catching, apart from <laughs> where you are. What recourse um, does an author have when a publisher withholds royalty statements or in worst case scenario, fiddles the numbers as I've heard happen in one case? Um, well, then a publisher is in breach of contract, so you're well within your right to cancel the contract. Um, if a publisher ever um, withholds royalties, then we send, um, you know, very sternly word of reversion, mm. saying they're in breach. I wonder if this person um, management or not, because it's... So perhaps they don't. Well, so for example, um, I've actually had an old author of Amy Heath get in touch saying that a publishing company in the US, he believes, is withholding his royalties. Um, and the only extenuating circumstances we could see were that the publishing company were bought by a bigger conglomerate. Not conglomerate, that's the wrong word. <laughs> a bigger publishing um, arm. And maybe it was just the matter of consolidation um but i in that scenario i think like badgering people all is the most effective way of getting an answer yeah find whoever you can if and the company can. yeah and just go in <laughs> yeah, oh yeah 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 um, yeah, no, good idea. Um, but what about the um, Society of Authors? Are there, I mean, I'd ask them as well. I'd ask them if there's anything. Oh, like definitely. Them. They're such a good resource. Um, and they they see pretty much everything. And they're like pretty inexpensive to join. The only thing they probably wouldn't be able to help with is if um, the publishing company was not necessarily reputable. Some of the contracts I see are shocking. Um, yeah, really shocking. And um, some of them too. I mean, it, you know, lawyers aren't good at, look, at looking at contracts. Either. They focus on all the wrong things, like completely the wrong things. So, you know, yeah, so true. They don't understand publishing contracts in the way that people who just live and breathe them do. So you need someone in publishing. I mean, I, I've got um, somebody, uh, a contracts person who... Um, it's very reasonable actually if you paid for it, I know lawyers charge about a thousand pounds or something or more, mm. um, just as a minimum to look at a publishing contract but this person um, doesn't charge anywhere near that so um, if anyone needs contract help then um, I can um, ask this person who uh, yeah I don't want to give her name out until I ask her but she yeah she does good stuff um, Stacey do you generally recommend writing first versus second or third person so writing what in first, second? Writing the first versus second or third person. Um, Depends on the book, doesn't it? It's very hard to do first person. Um, oh, sorry, there was more to that. And are there certain genres, circumstances that where you suggest a particular viewpoint of being more suitable for? I think in most cases, second person is um, the most appropriate. Do you agree? I think I see. Is uh, I agree with you, but weirdly. Um, but last speaker we had, she really likes first person. I always tend to say that first person with very very commercial, but kind of women's fiction or young. Yeah. Person yeah yeah which it works in that scenario yeah. or if you're hilary mantel writing the mirror you know will fall <laughs> yeah. um stacy maybe, maybe you should study that because that's it that if that's a nice exception like somebody um writing in that way um if, in literary fiction then a be good example um sean do you enjoy the editorial aspects of working with a manuscript what's your initial approach um big picture Yes, I, I definitely do. Um, and yeah, it is big picture. It's, um, it's structure, it's not, not often characterization, but sometimes um, that's necessary. Um, plot. And uh, yeah, I think those are the three key things that I focus on and also length because I just, I'm, I'm quite rare in that 
personally, I like longer novels, but it never seems like other people do. People like shorter books. Um, so yes. Oh, your poll has just come up. Well, just popped up. Yes. <laughs> How exciting. It works. Um, it really does. <laughs> I was supposed to launch, um, it, launch it in your face. I'm very sorry. That's okay. Uh, the, um, Ramona is asking if her friends had a novel simultaneously published in the UK and the US. Um, mm -hmm. Is this so in your case? I'm not sure what you mean there, Ramona. It would depend on the publisher as to how they publish rather than the agent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think it's increasingly common to publish, if not simultaneously, then quite close together because of um, cannibalization of sales um, across the continent, both ways. So US publishers, if it's published um, too far ahead of them, then they get really skittish about it and don't like, mm. um, don't like too long a gap. Oh, that's interesting because they are scared that copies might seep in somewhere. Yeah. 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 Um, what we heard a few speakers ago is that increasingly, um, you know, Germany is such a big market that some, they had a few instances of books being published in Germany first and then, yeah. and, then and, and coming back. So we've, yeah, we've had a, like not loads, but a few cases of that, definitely. And cases of where we found a German publisher for a book before we found a UK publisher. Germans can be really quick off mark and if they like something, they go for it. Mm. Um, and it's a very strong market. Um, so that's not, the, that's not the craziest thing I've heard. Mm. Mm. Brilliant. Um, Okay, so last question before we kill you and be too exhausted to take any of the submissions that are bound to come in from London Writers Club people. Um, do you think the current climate pre-pandemic is better or worse for ethnic minority, British, Asian, Hindu people, for example? Fiction. Uh, hmm, I, and does an author need to build up a social media following before you consider taking them on? Do you mean, I think you mean uh, fiction. Um, Hina, I think you mean fiction. Um, so the first question is, do you think it's better or worse for ethnic minorities um, now? Um, I think it's better. There, um, there are more imprints. Oh, sorry. Am I back? Yeah, you're back. It's because everyone, everyone is video calling at the moment. I don't know if I don't, obviously it's because we're all stuck in our own homes, but yeah. both these times that my video is cut out is because my sister's been trying to talk to me. <laughs> oh, right, yeah, 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 no, that's, um, I, I sort of, I don't know what you do, um, I don't know what you do to stop that, actually, yeah. Uh, ruthlessly decline, that's what I've been doing. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, what, and, but some people are really, go away. <laughs> really, my mum does this thing where if, you, if she tries on the landline and you don't answer within a certain time, she'll then ring your mobile, which is on the other end of the house, and you're going, and then she'll start on, on WhatsApp on the, on the iPad. And I'm like, Mum, yeah, know? my mum does that as well. She waits till I'm on WhatsApp and then she calls me, and I'm like, Well, I can't screen your call now because I'm already on WhatsApp. <laughs> yeah. um, but back to the person's question, um, I do think it's a better time because there are real concerted efforts in publishing to hire people that have not typically been um, well represented in publishing. Yeah. There are lots of schemes, there are more imprints dedicated solely to underrepresented voices. Um, so I definitely think it's a much better time. Um, and what was this? I've I've forgotten what the second question. Oh gosh, I'm trying to I'm trying to write poll and I'm cutting it all. Um, do you uh, think if uh, a novelist needs to build up a social media following before you consider taking them on? No, definitely not. Um, yeah, it's um, like it's it's never going to be frowned upon to have one, <laughs> um, yeah. but it's really not necessary in the same way that sadly 
some publishers seem to consider it necessary for nonfiction. Which, yeah, which, yeah. Well, that's a whole other conversation. Can I call you back another time to talk to you about just nonfiction, please? Because that's a really interesting one. So, yeah, of course. We're, we're committed. Yeah. I need to, I now need to send you a bottle of champagne for this and for the future. No, not, I promise. Not, um, can you tell, and I, I, I mean, I'm just not just saying that. Um, can you, last question, um, are there any red flags in a submission letter, letter that you would make you think, oh, I'm, I'm not going to read, I can't, I can't. Oh, a lot. There are so many. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> um, and this is because for many years I've also handled the submissions of one of my colleagues, Bill Hamilton. Um, one, I know a lot of people now, oh, she has strong thoughts, strong thoughts about um, red flags and submission letters as well, I can tell. <laughs> um, one, it's so apparent if you've sent out a mass email and haven't tailored it to me. Um, or to my colleague, it's it's it takes me w literally one second to see whether this is something that's actually come into me. And as soon as I can tell that it's just a generic, you have this profile on the website, and for those reasons, I'm submitting to you. Um, we get so many people emailing saying because of your interest in X. And I just think, well, I'm not interested in X. And so for that reason, you clearly haven't thought about this enough for me to be invested in your submission letter. And I know that sounds really harsh to a lot of people, but we get thousands of submissions, thousands. And it's really, it's really great when you get a submission when someone has really taken the time to pick you and say why you and it is so it makes such a difference it makes reading a submission letter exciting um you know and you're just eager in a way that when you're clearly one of 50 other agents that have been submitted to um it's it you just you can't have the same level of excitement and i know that's a really difficult thing for an author to hear because obviously they want to submit to as many agents as they possibly can. But I would urge if you do want to do that, then at least stagger it so that you're not sending out lots of submissions in one day. Because I have the same issue in that I submit my author's work to editors and I know they can tell that I've taken the time to address it to them. So it's really about putting thought and care into a submission because you will never, ever get the chance to submit for the first time to an agent again. Ooh. Sorry, that was the dog mute. Um, you never have that freshness. But I think, you know, it, it's, I don't think it's tough because, um, if you are reading a letter that looks like a generic letter, you're basically reading a, a dead document. And, you know, it's, it's yeah. Different. But if they've tailored it to you, then it's fresh and it's you know it's really worth reading. Um, and on that note, um, oh look, this isn't a question; it's just a final um, reflection. It's such a lovely one to end on. I've never had so many queries from my relatives read a good book to read. I think people are reading more at the moment with a big smile from Julie here. And that's lovely. Um, my dog, meanwhile, is in my basket trying to steal treats or something. So the last time, I, as I said, I had guinea pigs having sex. I guess this is preferable to quietly snuggling rather than squealing, which is what those guinea pigs were doing as they were <laughs> humping each other. Um, so no humping tonight, but we've had the most fantastic chat. With Florence Rees and um, we, um, I, sh I, if I knew how to um, quickly unmute any, oh, here we go, unmute all. We can all um, give you a round of applause. Can we hear? Ooh. No, I can't hear. Round of applause. No, it's not working. Never mind. We tried. We tried. Um, no, it was it was really great, and it's always interesting to have these there? conversations. Yeah. No, can't hear. Um, yes, and it's 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 deep, and and when you're in the room with um, our people, um, and tonight there are lots 
of people who haven't been to one of our events before, but when you're in a room with our people, one thing that the agents always say is that the questions are really, really good. And you can tell the people are properly writing and submitting and, and thinking about it all. So thank you so much, everyone. Please, please um, fill in the poll. And um, if you have any other messages for um, Florence, I'll pass them on, but please get her details from her website. And um, yes, on the website. Very, very much. Um, and um, we will be submitting to you, and we'll also, I'll also be talking to you about non fiction as well. Definitely, always up for that. Um, no, thank you. This was really interesting. I hope everyone stays safe and well and inside. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we all need a, a, well, you need a, a drink now. Um, a drink now, and, and the rest of us, um, everyone, have a brilliant evening. Thank you so much for coming. Do um, thank you. Any other questions? Um, and um, yeah, we'll we'll try and engage with you. Join on the Facebook group and. Um, who knows, I could even, might even get Florence back on there at some point, but please submit to her and please think about your submission and make it beautiful and lovely. All right, thank you so much. Seconded. No worries, thank you so much. Have a good evening. Yeah. Cheers.